Hi everyone, and welcome back to Pocus Cases. Today we're going to look at left ventricular systolic dysfunction. Let's start off with a case. This is a 65-year-old female who comes into the emergency department complaining of shortness of breath. She describes her shortness of breath as worsening when she ambulates to the point where she can't even go from her bedroom to her bathroom without having to hold onto the wall, stop, and try to catch her breath. Even when she's at rest, she's quite short of breath. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're probably saying, well, when do I pick up the ultrasound probe in this case? Well, I do it whenever I see someone who's exertionally short of breath, anytime they have unexplained hypotension, anytime they have unexplained shortness of breath, or when there's clinical findings of volume overload. Let's take a look at whether point of care ultrasound is helpful at looking for left ventricular function. If you look at this article, internal medicine residents were basically as good as a cardiologist because their ability to assess for left ventricular function correlated quite well with formal echocardiography. Physicians had high sensitivity and specificity, and there was good inter-rater reliability. Emergency medicine residents were also quite good at finding left ventricular systolic dysfunction in patients with suspected cardiovascular disease. ER residents identified LV dysfunction correctly greater than 90% of the time. Now let's take a look at the views that we use in order to determine if there's left ventricular systolic dysfunction. Now there's really four main views of the heart that you can generate with a point of care ultrasound machine. The sub xiphoid view is probably the easiest to obtain. It's probably the best view for pericardial effusions. However, for left ventricular systolic dysfunction, it's not very helpful, and we don't generally use sub xiphoid views to help us with LV dysfunction. The personal long axis view is also good for pericardial effusion, and it's one of the best for assessing for cardiac LV function. So this is one we're definitely gonna use. The personal short axis view it's pretty good for looking for RV strain and global contractility. It can tell you about wall motion abnormalities, but unless you're a POCUS expert, it's probably not going to be a useful view for you for assessing for left ventricular systolic dysfunction. So we're also not going to be using this view to help us today. And finally, the apical four chamber view probably is the best for determining RV strain and it's also quite good at LV function as well. So we'll also use this view to determine if patients have left ventricular systolic dysfunction. We're mainly going to be using our cardiac probe as it has a smaller footprint and it allows us to see in between the ribs quite nicely to assess the heart's function. In order to do the personal long scan, we're going to place the probe with the marker angled towards the patient's right shoulder and the beam pointing straight through into the patient's back. We place the probe, as the name suggests, right beside the sternum. The parasternal long view will be right beside the sternum at the level of the nipple line, more or less. You may need to look a rib space above or a rib space below, or you might need to roll their patient onto their left side to get a better view. But hopefully, if you place the probe in this location, you're going to get a view that looks somewhat like this. Let's take a look at the anatomy of the parasternal long view. This chamber right here is our right ventricle. Over here, we have our left ventricle and our left atrium. As blood flows through the left atrium, it will go through the mitral valve into the left ventricle and then out the left ventricle through the aortic valve into the aortic outflow tract. After blood goes through the aortic outflow tract, it will loop around the arch of the heart and it will go down to the descending aorta. The area between the right and left ventricle is the septum and the area around our heart down here is the pericardium. To generate the apical four chamber view, we're gonna have the probe just below the nipple with the beam angled towards the patient's right shoulder and the marker angled towards the patient's right flank. Now, you may need to move the probe in a few inner spaces in order to generate this image on the right. And just as a reminder, the apical four chamber view, it's not the most easiest view to obtain, especially if you're a beginner in POCAS. It does take quite a lot of experience to obtain this view, as there's a lot of subtle movements that you need to do to obtain this view. So don't be discouraged, keep practicing, and you'll eventually get quite good at obtaining this view. Some tips include rolling the patient onto their left side and having the patient breathe all the way out 
and have the patient move their left arm above their head to widen the rib spaces. That will allow you to move the probe in order to generate this nice image. Let's take a look at the anatomy of the apical four-chamber view. Here, this chamber is the right ventricle. On this side, we have our left ventricle. This chamber down here is our right atrium, and this chamber here is our left atrium. We also have the septum separating the right and the left ventricle. We also have the valve between the left atrium and left ventricle, which would be the mitral valve. And we have the valve over here in between the right atrium and the right ventricle, which is the tricuspid valve. When I play the video, you'll see all four chambers visible on the screen with the valves moving. This is an adequate apical four-chamber view, which will allow you to assess for left ventricular systolic function. So let's look at how we assess for left ventricular cardiac function. There's really three features that tell us how the left ventricle is functioning. We can see all of these features on both the personal long and the apical four-chamber view. The first is, how well is the mitral valve moving? The closer the anterior leaflet comes to the septum, the better the contractility. If it comes within one centimeter, well, that's normal movement, which would indicate normal left ventricular function. The second is left ventricular size. The more dilated the left ventricle, the more the dysfunction. If the left ventricle isn't dilated more than five centimeters, that is considered normal. Finally, there's LV contractility. The left ventricle should contract by at least a third. If it contracts by at least a third, that is considered normal. Now let's take a look at what that looks like. We'll start with the personal long view. Here's the right ventricle. Here's the left ventricle. Here's the left atrium. Here's the aortic outflow tract. Here's the septum. And you'll see the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve when I play the video open and close. This is what normal looks like. The anterior leaflet of the mitral valve comes quite close to the septum. It almost looks like the anterior leaflet is high-fiving the septum. Some people call this septal slap. Some people call it E-point septal separation. Regardless of what you call it, what you're looking for is for the mitral valve to come within a centimeter of the septum. If it comes within a centimeter of the septum, which in this case it clearly does, that is considered normal. Also, take a look at the left ventricle and how it contracts. If you look at the middle of the left ventricle, you can see that the walls are coming together. The muscular wall is coming closer to the muscular wall over here. And when the heart transitions from diastole to systole, you see that the heart is contracting more than a third of its, of its diameter. Finally, when you look at the width of the left ventricle, you can see that it's not more than five centimeters. Here's our centimeter bars on the side here. Now let's take a look at what left ventricular dysfunction looks like. You can clearly see that this heart is beating quite different from the one on the left side of the screen. First, it looks very apparent that the anterior leaf of the mitral valve is not coming close to the septum. This is definitely more than one centimeter. It doesn't look like it's high-fiving it. It doesn't look like it's slapping it. It's definitely more than one centimeter. Next, you'll notice that the septum and the free wall of the left ventricle's muscles are not coming together well. They're not coming together by a third of the diameter. And when you measure the diameter from here to here, it's getting close to more than five centimeters. So this is an example of what left ventricular systolic dysfunction looks like. Here's another example. When I play this video, you'll see the anterior leaf of the mitral valve is not coming close to the septum. It's more than one centimeter. Secondly, the septal wall and the free wall of the left ventricle are not contracting together by close to a third of the diameter. And finally, when you measure this wall to this wall, it's more than five centimeters. This once again shows left ventricular systolic dysfunction. Now let's take a look at the apical four chamber views. Once again, on the left, you'll see what a normal beating heart looks like for left ventricular systolic function. 
just as a reminder, this is the right ventricle, this is the right atrium, this is the left atrium, and this is the left ventricle. Here's the mitral valve, here's the septum. When I play the video, you'll see that the mitral valve opens and closes, and the mitral valve looks like it's touching the septum when it fully opens. Secondly, you'll notice that the septal wall is moving with each contraction, and it gets closer to the free wall, which also gets closer to the septum. This is contracting by at least a third. Finally, if you measure the diameter, you will see that it is less than five centimeters. This is what normal left ventricular systolic function looks like. Let's take a look at this video. Once again, you'll see a drastic difference between the two videos. In the video on the right, you'll see that when the mitral valve opens, it doesn't come within a centimeter of the septum. Secondly, you'll notice that the septal wall and the wall of the left ventricle are not coming together by more than a third, and the diameter is greater than five centimeters. This is what left ventricular dysfunction looks like in the apical four-chamber view. Let's take a look at another example with the apical four-chamber view. First, very strikingly, the mitral valve is not even coming close to the septum, definitely more than one centimeter. Secondly, the septum and the free wall are not contracting by more than a third, and the diameter is quite enlarged. The left ventricle looks very dilated. This is what LV dysfunction looks like. A few words of caution. First, when patients have left ventricular dysfunction, they may end up with chronic left ventricular dysfunction, meaning that they'll always have some degree of left ventricular dysfunction. So if you put the ultrasound probe on just anybody, you may find that they have left ventricular dysfunction, but that may not be the cause of their presentation of shortness of breath in the emergency department. So be very cautious that if someone's known to have left ventricular dysfunction, that they may have the exact same amount of dysfunction today as they had a year ago. Thus, their presentation of shortness of breath may not be related to the left ventricular dysfunction you're seeing. It's always important to compare to previous echoes that they may have and judge whether their function today is the same as their previous echo. Now, people may have exacerbations of their CHF, or they may have worsening of their left ventricular dysfunction causing their symptoms of their presentation today. It's always important to compare their current left ventricular dysfunction to their previous echoes if one's available. Secondly, clinical correlation may be required. Besides our much smaller paychecks, this is one of the other things that separates us from the radiologists. We have the advantage of seeing the patient, examining the patient, putting the focus on the patient, and making a decision about their clinical status. If the patient's coming in with shortness of breath, worse when lying down, worse with exertion, having swelling in their ankles that's new, hearing crackles in their lungs, and if you're the type of person who looks at JVP, seeing elevated JVP, then obviously this could be related to the heart failure that you're seeing on the POCUS. If, however, the patient is having none of those symptoms, and they have, say, a cough as the reason why they're having a shortness of breath, and you see that they have LV dysfunction, that may be chronic LV dysfunction. So it's important that you assess the patient, clinically correlate what you're seeing clinically with what you're seeing on your point of care ultrasound. The other benefit we have is we can slide the ultrasound probe over to look at things like beelines or pleural effusions to give us a better idea of how the patient's doing. Speaking of beelines, I will have a dedicated video regarding beelines at some point in POCUS cases. Beelines are game changers. If you see beelines, it will change your management in that shortness of breath NYD patient. Beelines represent interstitial syndrome. They're lines that run from the pleural line all the way down the screen, and they get wider as they go down the screen. 
they represent interstitial syndrome. Interstitial syndrome can be pulmonary fibrosis, can be pulmonary edema. We can see it in interstitial pneumonia. So it has a differential to it. But in the setting of somebody who's having shortness of breath on exertion, leg swelling, crackles, and you see beelines, you can almost be assured that they're having an exacerbation of their LV dysfunction. Next, you can also look for pleural effusions. Here is the liver. Here is the diaphragm. And when I play the video, you'll see there's a lot of black cephalad to the diaphragm. This is all pleural fluid here. If a patient's having an acute CHF exacerbation, you can see bilateral pleural effusions in some patients. This will help distinguish the cause of their shortness of breath. In summary, the subxiphoid view and the short axis views are not overly helpful to assess for LV function. The two main views would be your personal long view and your apical four-chamber view. And we're looking for findings like the mitral valve movement, the size of the LV, the contractility of the LV. The mitral valve should come within one centimeter of the septum and looks like it's slapping it or high-fiving it. The LV should be smaller than five centimeters. And the LV should contract by approximately a third, if not a little bit more, in a normal healthy heart. If you're not seeing these findings, that's consistent with left ventricular systolic dysfunction. Finally, be cautious of the people who have chronic left ventricular dysfunction. They will not have normal left ventricles in the emergency department. So if you just put the probe on anybody, you may find this. And it's always important to correlate this clinically with other findings in their chief complaint and what their symptoms are. And if possible, correlate to their previous echoes to see if this dysfunction is previously known or not. As always, I love hearing from you. If you have any questions or comments, please send them to pocuscases at gmail.com.